I'd say manage your expectations and know the laws, know know your obligations, mm -hmm. and you know you can get in a lot of trouble for not having smoke detectors or CO detectors, small things like that that you can do to uh, um, make the rental process smoother mm -hmm. and just keep the lines of communication open. Communication is key to mm -hmm. having a smooth landlord-tenant relationship. <laughs>
Um, if, if you're not providing that for people, they're going to go on, they're going to move on to some other house, mm -hmm. and you're going to miss out on you know, a good portion of the market. Um, so that being said, a lot of people consider not allowing pets at their home because they right. think that there's going to be damage. Um, and most people do have pretty well-trained dogs. They're not going to be chewing up the baseboards and everything like that. And typically we do uh, collect a pet deposit, just like a security deposit mm -hmm. for any pet that would be here. Standard what we do is $300, um, and we have that be refundable. A lot of landlords want to do a non-refundable pet deposit, right. but we feel that um, if you make it refundable, it gives the tenant some incentive to not cause the damage. No, you know? they can get it back at the end. Right, exactly. If they paid 500 bucks, they're like, oh, well, I've already you know, paid for the damage. Might as well just let the dog run by. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, definitely want to avoid that. And uh, on, on the tenant side, you know, you know what they're looking for as far as landlords for investment properties. What are some suggestions uh, as a tenant if you're out there right now trying to find something? Because it's, it's sparse, right? Yes, it's very sparse. Uh, a lot of times they rent within days of hitting the market. Mm -hmm. um, people come to us at showings and they're complaining that they've already missed out on three houses so far. You know, what can I do to get this house? Um, so the best thing is to plan ahead and give yourself plenty of time to find a place. Mm -hmm. You know, some people show up with all their stuff in a pickup truck at my office. They're like, hey, I need a place to rent today. And I'm like, I, I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to be able to help you. Yeah. Um, so looking ahead of time. Um, but some people start looking, you know, three months ahead of time, mm -hmm. whereas most tenants are only required to give a 30 or 60 days notice. Right. So the landlords won't even know that it's coming available until 30 days ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So the ideal time, I guess, to start looking would be uh, 30 days ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go to these showings as a tenant and you're looking at a house, you know, take a look around how it's maintained and ask a lot of questions. Make sure you know exactly what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, we've recently had a fully furnished, all-inclusive rental that the people were in a hurry to try and, you know, desperate situation trying to find a place. And mm -hmm. she got there and she was like, oh, this will work. And then she moves in and she's got all her dishes and everything. And she had nowhere to put them. She had nowhere to put them. And she's like expecting us to rent a storage space for her dishes. And it's like, well, you know, this yeah, is all inclusive. Furnished, they're yeah. here, you know, so that's sort of on her. And huh. I would have not like makes sense to hear right. that but that's that's a surprise right i mean yeah. it never crossed my mind i never thought it would happen we we're very upfront about right. the fact that everything was inclusive but it just goes back to you know make sure you know what you're getting into mm -hmm. and manage your expectations properly all right absolutely absolutely uh, as you guys are you know working with landlords tenants etc are you saying that are you seeing any common uh, uh pieces of friction or, or places of friction between that relationship um yeah, I guess the main thing would be repairs not being made on time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times it's an issue of the homeowner doesn't think it's important or they just don't have the money to fix it. Um, but they need to know that when they're getting into the landlord game, um, I mean, this is a, a, a business. You need to be <laughs> running your rental home as you would run a business. Mm -hmm. It's not just a side hobby or something right. like that. You need to make sure that you have the money in place so that you can make repairs if need be. What would be a, an example of a repair that a tenant would be responsible for and an uh, example of a repair that a landlord would be responsible for? Um, well, typically the landlord is required to make sure that the house is fit and habitable for mm -hmm. the tenant. Um, so landlords out there, if you want to look it up, your obligations are laid out in North Carolina GS 42-42. Okay. And then the tenant's obligations are 42-43. Okay. So those are like literally the North Carolina laws that will explain. Well, we'll make sure to are. put those links up as <laughs> yeah. well so that, so that somebody yeah, can reference that in the comments. Them. Yeah. Um, but so example, like I okay. here's a common one: ants, or like this time of the year. Yeah. Who's okay. responsible for so stuff like that? Currently, um, I'm dealing with a house that has mice. Okay. And so initially, my thoughts are, you know, there may be some problems with the structure. This is probably going to be mm -hmm. on the landlord. Um, but we get over there, and the tenant her place is just a wreck. There's yeah. open food everywhere, there's brown sugar laying out, there's flour laying out, and of course there's mice. Yeah. So often we rely on Terminix or whoever the exterminator handyman is to give mm -hmm. us their opinion on what caused the issue. And if it's something the tenant did, we'll charge it back to them. Um, but if it's something that's on the landlord, of course the landlord would have to pay for it. So you guys will handle it and then worry about who's responsible for paying it afterwards? Exactly. So we'll, we'll determine the best cause mm -hmm. um, and 
usually we err on the side of the landlord paying for things unless we can prove that it was the tenant, you know. Gotcha. Um, but in this case, it, it was very obvious, you know, just by tenant. walking in the door <laughs> and, you know, confirmed by the, the guy from Terminix. Right. Um, but if it were the case that, you know, she was living clean and had no problems mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, her sanitary conditions and there was just like holes in the foundation or, you know, they were coming in mm -hmm. from underneath the sink right. or something like that, that would be on the homeowner. Mm -hmm. What about, so are there any repairs that are, are timely repairs? Like, uh, well, anything dealing with water, you want to fix immediately. Um, because you have to or because it's bad for the structure of the property? Both. Okay. Um, so like, let's say my hot water heater breaks. Your hot water heater breaks, most likely it's leaking. Um, mm -hmm. So unless you have a pan that's draining to the outside, mm -hmm. that definitely needs to be fixed right. immediately. Not only do your tenants need hot water for showers and mm -hmm. baths and things like that, um, but you don't want to have damage to your home. Okay. So another water issue would be like a, a roof leak. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not a bad roof leak and it's not like actively leaking into their living room, some landlord may think that it, it'd be fine to just let it go. Right. But what's going to happen is that Over roof time, leak yeah. is going to get more <laughs> expensive and also it's going to be soaking the ceiling and the other things in the attic. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking at a mold situation. Yeah. And once you get into a mold situation, it is like minimum thousands of dollars. I mean, yeah. just to send a guy over there to test for mold is like a thousand dollars. So you want to get those taken care of as soon as possible. Yeah, nip it up front, yeah. no doubt. Uh, I know there's a, you know, we were talking about uh, chatting today and there's a couple of things that you thought it'd be really good for landlords to know. Uh, do you want to share what those tips are? Uh, yeah, um, it basically goes, it ties into what we've been saying. You just, you want to provide a home that your tenants can be proud to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, if you provide a good home like that, then they're going to take good care of it and they're going to be good tenants and likely they're going to want to stay a long time. Right. Um, and that's really the name of the game is keeping down the vacancies. That's right. what really makes things most profitable for homeowners. Turnover. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So every time it comes vacant, you're going to have to clean carpets, have the place cleaned, you know, you're going to miss out on possibly mm -hmm. a month's worth of rent. Um, so that's another thing, when you're thinking about pricing your home to rent, um, everyone tries to squeeze every last dollar out of it. You mm -hmm. know, they hear tales of how crazy the rental market is here in Asheville, and oh, so-and-so rented their house yeah. for like $3,000, I wanna do that too. Um, <laughs> so they're trying to squeeze every dime out of it, and really if they just come down on the rent, it'd probably be more profitable in, in the long Over run. Over the three year period or right. whatnot. So let's take for example, two houses, three bedrooms, mm -hmm should rent for about 1500 One landlord tries to squeeze 1600 out of it, one drives for 1500 So the guy at 1500 has a ton of people interested in his house, and you know a lot of people apply, and he has his pick of applicants, and mm -hmm. people want to move in within a couple weeks. Um, so that's the ideal situation. Right. This other guy is, could possibly get another $100 a month, but it's, you know, it sits there for like six weeks. Then finally, someone comes along that applies, and they're not that great, but he's desperate, mm -hmm. so he's going to go with that person. And he's missed out on $1,500 because it sat right. vacant for a month. And yeah, he made another $100 a month for the mm -hmm. year lease, but that's only $1,200. He would have been $300 ahead if he had just rented it for $1,500, and he would have had his pick of applicants. Right. So he wouldn't have had to just take the first Joe Schmo that comes and along willing to live there. More than likely, they're going to stay there, right? Somebody's, right, exactly. Somebody's making a push to make the 1600 a month, they might 12 months after just be like, hey, it's not yeah, worth it. Yeah, they're so, gonna be looking, yeah. you know, three months before their lease ends, trying to get out of get that. Get out of that, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I, I've always heard, when I first got into the, in, into the real estate world, uh, uh, a saying that says, uh, there's no such thing as a bad tenant, there's just a lazy landlord. What's your perspective on that? Um, I don't know, there are bad tenants out there. There are professional tenants that if, will. <laughs> would they be able to become a tenant though if there was a if the landlord did a good job in pre-screening? That's a good point. Uh, if you do all your upfront background mm -hmm. checks and rental references, then you will know that you're dealing with a bad tenant and you won't rent to them. Mm -hmm. and that situation right. will be avoided completely. Um, so that's a big thing. We talked to previous landlords before we let anybody move in with us. Yeah. We asked them if they paid their rent on time, if they got their whole security mm -hmm. deposit back, right. if you'd rent to them again, if you got complaints from the neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. Okay. One of the issues right now that I've heard, you know, whispered on the streets, if you will, yeah. is, the, is the, you know, how is somebody supposed to move when security deposits and moving costs are so high? Is that just part of the game and if you want to live you kind of just have to deal with that or is there yeah a unfortunately act there? that's that's just sort of the way it goes i mean no landlord in their right mind would 
let someone move into their house without first collecting at least the first month's rent and a security deposit. Mm -hmm. So unless you can scrounge up, you know, two times the amount of the rent to move in, uh, possibly more if you have a pet and have yeah. to pay a pet deposit on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's really just supply and demand. Right. And there's other people, everyone and their brother wants to move to Asheville, so there's tenants lining up for showings. Yeah. So if, you know, tenant A can't do it, there's probably going to be people lining up to do it. Um, so, of course, the landlord's going to keep that high rent mm -hmm. and the high security deposit. And, it, and it's, it, it creates a better, a healthier dynamic between tenant and landlord, right? Right. You don't want to have the landlord being like, hey, okay, fine. I'll waive the security deposit in the next six months. You can pay me $100 a month on right. top of rent. Yeah, no. Like that's, that would never work out. That'd be the recipe <laughs> for disaster, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would you say just in general as you're thinking about what's going to happen to the rental market over the next, say, year or two here in Nashville? Do you, where do you see it going? Uh, it's interesting. Um, they're building a whole lot of apartments around mm -hmm. here, so I think that's going to be a significant amount of competition for your one and bedroom, one and two bedroom places mm -hmm. around here. Um, you know, we might see that average two bedroom drop down to closer to a thousand instead of twelve bed instead of twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. um, seeing with all these apartments coming in, you could rent one of those for nine hundred. Right. Um, and they just offer a lot more things that some of these older homes, a lot of people are renovating houses yeah. from the 20s, and they just don't have the parking or washer and dryer or amenities, mm -hmm. you know, that no apartment pools. complex. <laughs> exactly, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, your average house in Monford does not have a pool. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, Glenn, really appreciate it. Uh, is there anything else that you, you would say is worth, uh, worth sharing with, uh, with our listeners? Um, I'd say manage your expectations and know the laws, know, know your obligations mm -hmm. and you know, you can get in a lot of trouble for not having smoke detectors or CO detectors, small things like that that you can do to uh, um, make the rental process smoother mm -hmm. and just keep the lines of communication open. Communication is key to mm -hmm. having a smooth landlord-tenant relationship. I've, yeah, definitely <laughs> I found that to be true and wholeheartedly agree. Right. Very cool. All right, man. Well, appreciate it so much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing some of your wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> Definitely uh, hope, you know, somebody who's watching this is going to be able to, to, to listen and how, have it be useful for them. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode. If you know somebody who's thinking about renting or, uh, you know, renting a place as a tenant or renting a place as a landlord, share this video with them. Hopefully, it's found something that is helpful for them and they might be able to avoid uh, any mistakes down the road. Appreciate it, y'all. Until next episode.